Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this latest edition of Tales from Outer Space, where I take stories from across the internet and read them for your entertainment. This particular story is called Who is That Human Gendarme? Written by Lead Azide 221. Do you think he's dead? The human gendarme sat motionless in his seat. Its arms were crossed and its head lay back on the shuttle wall. It had been like this for hours. The Spectadian started to shuffle the cards once more and replied back with the Inquisitive Elf. It was only natural. This was the Elf's first time traveling out in space. Well, uh, if you want to find out, uh, be my guest. The Spectalian slowly turned its head and looked at the gendarme, motionless as always. The Spectalian shook his head. I am not going to mess with it. We've learned our lesson as a species, especially with those particular humans. Those humans? The Spectalian pointed to a column of patches that was so on the gendarme's right arm. They were all circular and of the same area, yet none looked like the other. According to those, the gendarme is a victor, a war veteran, a Zaplin outblast citizen, and an NIF party member. Some of the most hardcore of the hardcore humanity has to offer. This didn't have the effect that the Spectalian thought it would have on the elf. The elf was rather unimpressed. I have uh, no idea what any of that means. The Spectalian sighed, or at least the interpretation apparatus sighed. It leaned forward and stared directly at the elf. The elf gulped and held its breath. The towering figure of the Spectalian always did make her nervous. Well, uh, being a war veteran is obvious. The only war that happened in their lifetime is the Frontier War. The elf thought for a few moments, trying to recall what the Spectalian was saying. When she remembered, she spoke up. Wait, you are telling me about the coalition war against the humans? Yes. The one where humans kept on dying so much that they were landing down on human corpses? Yes. The Spectalian pointed at the second patch, a large human symbol encompassing much of the patch. According to that, he, that human, was the one the fifth wave. I don't remember the exact casualty rate for that one, but it was high. Some 70% perhaps. Out of all the humans who died, the gendarme survived. It's telling. The elf lay silent. After all, how was one supposed to respond to a comment like that? Noting the elf silent, the Spectadian continued on. That land of blast is a notorious in our whole world. More infamous than the human country it makes up. They were the main opposition and enemy during the chronic revolutionary war. Our first contact with the humans. They were ruthless. We didn't understand their way of conflict at all. Instead of engaging one-on-one, -on -one, face to face like all other battles, they followed a fighting philosophy of hit and run. They would hide behind an obstacle, such as a tree or a rock. They take shots at our most valuable personnel and run away once we got our asses off the ground. We considered it to be cheap dishonorable tactic. Only recently have we acknowledged their superior engagement rules, especially since we learned what they were equipped with. They practically beat us with the equivalent of sticks and stones. The Spectalian then pointed to the green and black patch. For this one, the elf could interpret the symbol. It was a capital I going down straight through an N. The National Identity Front had a truce with the People's Liberation Front during the Second Croson War to fight us and the Croson. I dare say that it was worse than the Frontier War, M much worse. After they forced us to surrender, our former ally, the Crozen, started to utilize NVC material. The Spectanian stopped speaking when it notes the Elf's confusion. Nuclear, biological, chemical. The Elf let out a silent O. Oh. The Spectanian continued. Yeah, yeah, it was pretty bad. You see all the armor the gendarme wearing, right? How could the Elf not? The black armor was covered all parts of the human. Not even the head was spared. In its place was a ballistic gas mask for a face and a metallic helmet for a head. The elf heard rumors that the lenses glowed a dim red whenever they felt bloodlust. The human world Lonsk is still contaminated to this day. The realization dawned upon the elf. Wait, you're not telling me their soldiers have been wearing that since that war? The Spectalian laughed. Or at least the device did. <laughs> no, I'm telling you that old humans have been wearing armor since the war. 
Never is there a moment where they don't wear their armor, or at least that I've seen. Oh, did they take it off? They croak. So many people did when the Crosens started to use NBC material. It's so ingrained in their brains they don't even take it off if they're off-world. The elf looked once more at the gendarme. She couldn't imagine wearing armor for her entire life. How would she tend to her scales, her tail? The Spectalion continued on with his talk. At this point, the elf wondered if the Spectalion was saying all of this just to explain it to her. After the war ended, the PLF collapsed and the NIF took control of the human lands. They still remain in power to this day. The Spectalion then pointed to the last symbol. It was a capital letter V, with a sword going down through it. That one might be the most significant. Victor has fought in every human war since the Second Croson War. Nowadays, with wars between alien species seemingly ending, they retooled themselves, offering their services abroad. It's not so much their gear that defines them, but rather their behavior. They represent the best and worst of humanity has to offer. Finally, done explaining all the patches, the Spectalians leaned back on the wall. It and the elf sat in silence for a while, listening to the hums of the shuttle. Yeah, for a rather mediocre species, they sure have been through a lot. The Spectalian then leaned forward and rested his head on his tentacles. Perhaps too much. Now that I think of it, I can't remember a time where they haven't been at war. Yeah, it sure seems we love war, no? The elf and the Spectalion turned to the gendarme. It was still as ever. Was I imagining it all? No, no, you're not. The Spectalion and the elf looked at each other, then at the human gendarme. Wait, have you been? I've been awake this entire time. Don't know why you would think otherwise. The gendarme then stood up and looked straight at the Spectalion. The Spectalion slid back in his seat a bit. Overall, I'd give it a 6 out of 10. Okay explanation, but you left out a lot of stuff. Makes us seem like monsters or something. The human gendarme started to chuckle a bit. The elf was feeding anything but amusement. The human then started to stretch. <laughs> well, uh, since you explained some of them, might as well go for the whole package. No, want to hear your take on it. The gendarme then turned around, his back facing the two. He was completely covered in patches, clots, and chits. Over some moments' pause, the elf hesitantly raised her hand. The human gendarme laughed. This isn't a damn school. You don't have to raise your hand like you need to go use the bathroom. Uh, well, um, my question is, well, you've done a lot of things. I didn't know that we were accompanied by such an accomplished human senior. The human gendarme tilted his head. <laughs> senior? God damn, didn't know I exuded such an aura of matureness. I'm only 26. End of story. Story number two. Race to Sol, written by Lyall Kins. At first, it was weird. First contact with the Cassigans about 2,000 years ago showed that between the two of us, there were similarities. But it was probably just a coincidence, right? Then, things got weirder. As more species started appearing, we noticed patterns. Sure, the similarity there or here could be coincidental, but almost every new species being similar, that was suspicious. Up until 274 years ago, we concluded convergent evolution. Digits were required for tool making and such. Anything else was just fringe science and uh, conspiracy. That is, until a certain team, then crackpot scientists, discovered that we did in fact share a commonality. All it took was a strand of DNA shared between each and every one of us within the League. We were related. It wasn't that the Cowlins were tepteds with tails or that the Cassigans were smaller Galernians. We were related. Then, millions of smaller but equally important discoveries were made. No longer were our individual cultural mythos similar. No, they were shared. Each and every one of our respective creation mythos they all shared universal themes, star children, disaster, far from home, and destiny to the stars. They were just different viewpoints from the same picture. The previously inconceivable peace between the Intelli and the Saragecus, they were made under joint discovery as both Science Republic worked together to uncover the mythos of our relation. 
It was their joint venture that found that the newly joined Yippon's home planet had a map, a painting stenciled in negative print by a long ago faded pigment onto a cave wall. We followed it. It took us 43 common league years. Oh, we found it, a comet, and on it, a library. We learned of our history that day, and by its end, we made sure that we could never forget it again. Of their regret, of their mistakes, and their subsequent exodus. Each 634 members of the Star League made sure of it. Culture, science, philosophy, it was all there, and an elusive comet. Yet, most important, clear and etched onto metal so it might never fade. Another map. Not of a comet, but of a solar system. But, like children, we bickered over other things inconsequential, and war broke out. A short yet devastating war that lit the galaxy on fire and consumed many lights. By its end, we were all so... broken. Yet, it was their stories that kept us going, their wisdom that granted us courage. How could we break so easily when our ancestors did not? When they braved the unforgiving sea of stars alone to find hope. When their one million strong colossus arcs reduced to 630. Eight. Our existence was proof that they did not give up and rebuilt. So too could we. The League was once again reformed, and with it an age of prosperity. Yet, the League would not be situated in any territory. No, there was only one place it should be. Once again, we were ready to journey amongst the stars, not with fire, but hope in our hearts. And what a voyage it was. At the beginning, it was only Star League research vessels. As time went on, others started joining us on our voyage. Merchant ships, the entire and dull nomadic fleet, freight alignments, dreadnought hulls, and more kept joining and joining, till the lights of the afterburners became a beacon for those who wished to see the cradle, to see Saw. Thirteen years, one last jump. I remembered it. The fleet larger than any fleet in League history combined. Ships as far as the senses could reach, and I could see. I remembered the silence as we all waited on the SLRV homebound to spool the last jump using an ancient soul technique for such colossal fleets. I remembered the crew on all bridge dressed in ceremonial garb as the clock ticked downwards. I recall vividly, we were the first to exit the jump. And as we crested Sol and its orbiting golden plates, it was illogical, but I wondered then whether the emotions I felt upon laying sight on the beautiful blue pearl were seared into my very DNA. There, in all her glory, she stood. Terra, the deep gash was still visible, but she had not died. She yet lived, and she had been waiting for us. No, we could not call ourselves Saul, but we are their grandchildren, and we are home. Memories from SLRV Hope Absolute, Admiral Researcher Haxam, year 8803. End of story. I would quickly like to thank our tier 5 patrons, Dragzoon WRE, Quantum Wednesday, Ambrose Catull, Lord Azrakal, Bushmaster177, Casper Arnholtz, Cam Maxwell, and Arcadian. Thank you very much.